Good morning and a very warm welcome to the 2022 Newnham Conversation on the subject of classics now in Cambridge and beyond. This also forms part of the Cambridge Alumni Weekend and we are being recorded. My name is Alison Rose, I'm the Principal of Newnham College and it's my very great pleasure to introduce two of our fellows. Prior Lecturer, Director of Studies in Classics and Trustee of the Fitzwilliam Museum, Dr. Carol Atak, and our first Anassis Classics Fellow at Newnham, Dr. Shushma Malik. They will be exploring the continued relevance of classics today. Political figures are often compared to figures in Greek or Roman literature or history, such as the Emperor Nero or the politician Alcibiades. And just last month, some of you will know that Boris Johnson compared himself to Cincinnatus in his final speech as Prime Minister. So today, Dr. Atak and Dr. Malik will explore the uses and abuses of classical authority. <laughs> Classics has been at the forefront of many of our minds in Newnham following the sad news of Joyce Reynolds' death on the 11th of September. So uh, Newnham has been flying a flag at half-mast for two very distinguished ladies in the last couple of weeks. Joyce was a fellow and later an honorary fellow of the college since 1951, a long-serving director of studies in classics and one of the most distinguished ancient historians in the world. Mary Beard spoke for many of us in her tribute to Joyce when she wrote that, quote, generations of Newnham classicists will also always remember the extraordinary support combined with the intellectual challenges she offered us, end of quote. I'm particularly delighted to introduce Dr. Shushma Malik, who joined Newnham and the Classics faculty in September as the Onassis Classics Fellow. The Anastics Classics Fellowship is the culmination of seven years of fundraising from the University of Cambridge Faculty of Classics, Newnham alumni and other generous donors and completed by a generous donation by the Anastics Foundation. And I thank the Anastics Foundation and alumna and Deputy Minister of Labour and Social Affairs in the Greek government, Dr. Domna Michelaidou, Newnham College 2008, who first put the Anastics Foundation and Newnham in contact and continues to play a vital role in this relationship. Dr. Malik previously held post at the universities of Roehampton, Queensland and Manchester. So there's quite a variety of temperature and climate around there. Her research interest includes the role of Roman emperors in 18th and 19th century texts, Roman religions and imperial historiography, and she's written and published widely. Her first monograph, The Nero Antichrist, Founding and Fashioning a Paradigm, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. And she's appeared on BBC Radio 4's In Our Time on Nero and the BBC World Service's The Forum, also on Nero, and the popular podcast, You're Dead to Me. Dr. Carol Atak once described herself to me as the only person who knows both about Greek coins and Bitcoins. <laughs> and she's regretted saying that to me because I trot it out every time I introduce her. <laughs> because there aren't many people who can say it off, obviously. Her research interests include the classical Greek political thought of Plato and Xenophon, the history of democracy in antiquity, and the contemporary reception of ancient political concepts. Her books include The Discourse of Kingship in Classical Greece, Anachronism in Antiquity, and The Cultural History of Demo Democracy in Antiquity. She's currently writing a monograph on the temporality of Plato's dialogues and editing a handbook of ancient Greek political thought. And she serves as associate editor for Greek political thought for the journal Polis. So I hope you all enjoy the conversation. Uh, our speakers have very kindly said they will take question and answer at the end. So there will be a chance uh, to ask them any questions at the end. So Carolyn Shushma, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that incredibly generous introduction, Alison. Um, very delighted to be speaking to, to you all today in conversation and to give you some insights into where, where Classics is now and where it's going at Newnham at what I think is a critical, critical moment of change in college, in the faculty, and more broadly at a time where Classics has been perhaps more central to public discourse than it has for some time. Um, I started, I put, put this picture behind me on the slide, the Gwen, Gwen Reverard Rever print of um, the wedding of Daphnis and Chloe, because it's a lovely pastoral scene and it always makes me think of the riverbanks, uh, Grantchester Meadows, and also a great moment to have a 
calming pastoral scene as term arrives on us. Um, our next slide, we also wanted to start by paying tribute to our foremothers here at Newnham as two relatively recent joiners to the Newnham Classics community. And I know that there are several people in the audience who have been a much longer standing part of that community than us. And we're very, both, I think, very proud to be part of that. Um, again, also for our delight in the SCR, the wonderful portrait of Jane Harrison. I wish I, wish I felt as calm as that, as term term approaches and were frantically scurrying around working out supervision arrangements for undergraduates and what week we're going to manage to do things and getting getting notes and everything ready for the coming term and obviously for Shashma that will be her very first term lecturing at, at Cambridge so we'll hear a bit more about about that later also we wanted to pay tribute to our more re the more recent Newnham tradition to honour the work of Joyce Reynolds, who I think is such a huge figure, both in not just in Newnham's history, but in the history of the discipline. And her work was absolutely transformational in ancient history, which is something... You know, and as, as you'll discover, Shushma's and my research interests intersect and overlap in ways we feel are going to be very productive. And Joyce Reynolds' work in making the study of ancient inscriptions central to the study of ancient history transformed that part of the subject from being something where you looked at the works of historians, like, I mean, for me, Thucydides, other Roman historians for Shushma and focused on documentary evidence. You could get closer, closer to the past. Also, decenters, decenters the political center. We both work on political power in the center. And so Joyce's work is a sort of interesting and important reminder to us that these are great worlds that span the whole Mediterranean and beyond and lots to do. Obviously, we have to say um, that it's a very daunting task following some of these amazing, amazing women. And Mary Beard's recent work and her public profile is a great example to us in how to communicate important aspects of the discipline. But we also have to remember, I think, in Cambridge, what a great teacher she has been and how inspiring and how her way of getting you to just take a second look, ask, what's actually going on here? Can I get a bit deeper into this? It's clearly something she learned as part of that tradition, but made a huge impact on me when I heard her make those lectures. Also, Pat Easterling, as the Regis Professor of Greek, her work on Greek tragedy and anachronism played a huge part in my own, own work. So we thought we'd start off by introducing our own research. And obviously, Alison has sort of done that a little bit for us. So we can, we can maybe hurry through, through that a bit and bring our yeah. own points. And we're going to sort of dip, ask each other questions about that as we go, and then focus a bit on political discourse and the classical in the present moment. I realized as I looked through the slides before setting off, there are so many different paths we could have taken yeah. through classics and the now. And a lot we could have said about art, a lot we could have said about drama. And we might get to talking about those in the questions. But this is our own angle, really, as people who look on rulership and leadership in past and present. So anyway, Shoshima, tell us, to introduce your research to the Newnham community. Thank you, Carol. Um, so to start with, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and um, thank you all very much for coming along to this and, and I'm really excited to be able to meet you and get to know you all, all better. 
Um, so I'm uh, the new <laughs> here, new at Neenham, and uh, my research interest, is, as Carol has said and as Alison has said already, um, is in Roman history, Roman political history, political culture. Um, but I also am very interested in um, sort of classical reception studies. So not just how politics operated in Rome, um, how Roman politics operated in Rome, but also how other people in later centuries have used those models, taken them, changed them for in different ways and have done really interesting things with them. So recently I've been working on um, a book chapter for a volume on Montesquieu and the different ways that he takes ideas of Roman emperors and completely transforms them to meet his own purposes, to make a political and philosophical argument. Um, but I also sort of like to be fairly wide ranging with the texts that I work with. So I've also published on Oscar Wilde and his use of classics, you know, as a, as a famous classicist. Um, and all of this really started with Nero. So I talk a lot about Nero, <laughs> and, um, as, as you probably gathered. Um, and it really, when I was an undergraduate, just struck me how much Nero pops up in all sorts of different places, how he's um, used as a decadent icon by someone like Oscar Wilde, how he is the antichrist in the early Christian tradition, how he's the, the archetypal sort of matricide, mad tyrant. Um, and it really depends on what you want to do with him as to which bits you focus on, right? Do you ignore the killing and just focus on, on, on his uh, aestheticism or, or whatever? But it's, it's really, I always found it very, very interesting how one character from history can be transformed in so many different ways and Nero really struck me as a really good example of that um, which is why I wanted to work on him more but um, really that's the, the current that goes through I would say my work so far. I will switch now to things that I'm sort of doing at the moment. Um, and actually that's sort of um, taken me to some <laughs> various different places, including recently over the summer um, with a, a wonderful team of collaborators from Leicester, Bristol, Manchester and Durham. Uh, we've been working on building a project with the National Trust and on their classical collections. And you're probably wondering why that's something <laughs> that um, uh, my research profile fits. But I find that aspect of, of sort of reception history fascinating as well because in these domestic spaces, individual owners of, of National Trust properties of these collections curated their own ideas of antiquity. And often that was informed by places they'd been, texts they've read. You walk through the libraries of some of these collectors and you see different designs that then turn up in various parts of their house. It's just, it's wonderful. Um, so we got to um, see lots of amazing material at Kingston Lacey and at Greenway, which of course is like the Christie's home, her summer home. So that was really wonderful, and, and we're building up a, a, a research um, proposal to be able to take that further with the National Trust, and, and that's a really exciting, exciting thing. And also the collaborative work is something I love as well, and that's why I'm really looking forward to kind of being able to work more closely with Carol too, because our, our interest intersect. Um, and then the other thing that I've sort of been, been really interested in and, and started working on and, and actually have a few slides about um, in, in just a few minutes um, is, again, about that time. It, we're, we're starting to sort of do bits of this now, but that time in, in the 18th and 19th century, particularly in the early 19th century, when things like periodical culture made antiquity ubiquitous in a political conversation, not just in, in, um, in Parliament, and we will see a few examples of that, but everywhere, in, in radical documents, antiquity was used on the one hand to say um, you know, Caesar was the ultimate tyrant, and on the other hand to say he was the ultimate um, ideal, ideal of a leader who was you know, strong and took everyone through. So I want to try and spend a bit of time, because there's so much of it, so much material, um, looking through archives and trying to get a sense of how political debate was shaped by um, particularly Roman, but we can chat about that, <laughs> particularly Roman ideas of politics, um, but also how they come into some really major points in our own political history. So the Reform Act, um, abolition of slavery, and I'm also interested in, on the one hand, how antiquity worked as a way to understand these things, but also how it might have hindered some things. So there's a there's a two sides, I think, to some of the research I've done so far. In any case, but it's a it's a very interesting um, period. I find it a, a fascinating period. And just to give you a little bit of an idea, 
Oh, here we go. Um, a few bits from Hansard. So one from 1831, which you'll, you'll recognise as, as a very key date in, in voting reform and, and the build-up and, and the aftermath of, of, of those kinds of bits of um, legislation. Um, and when people are talking, you've got a mixture of, of sort of radicals and Tories here. Um, Cicero comes up. I won't read out the whole quote, but you can hopefully see... Uh, just, just over here, a little bit of a, um, an idea of, of, of Cicero and, and what, you know, um, what would, not what would Cicero do as such, but in, in this context of talking about these big political mo movements, in this case it's the ballot, so whether um, voting should be secret or, or public, what does Cicero have to say about this? What can Cicero tell us about this? And then also, I quite like, um, at the bottom, uh, um, uh, Mr. Hunt, um, Henry Hunt, who, of course, was uh, um, a radical and a very famous one, um, very uh, a notable person in, in Peterloo, um, he sort of basically says, well, let's stop thinking about Cicero and let's start to think about our own time and what we need right now. <laughs> so there's yeah. a bit of a kickback from him. He doesn't get his way. Cicero wins out, incidentally, on this particular point uh, at this particular time. Of course, it is instituted later on. Um, but I just wanted to also kind of contrast that with something from February 2022. So this year, this isn't something that's just a relic of the 19th century or the 18th mm -hmm. century, um, when um, in the Nationality and Borders Bill, so some, you know, one of the most controversial pieces of legislation to go through our Parliament you know, this year, I would say, one of them, um, we, we again get an idea of when we're trying to talk about what a subject is, what a citizen is, Cicero, again, comes in. And it's, it's the very famous um, bit, I'm sure you'll all, all know it, um, of, of the Verres story, I am a Roman citizen. Saying I am a Roman citizen means that he cannot be flogged. It means he has to go back to Rome and face trial as a Roman citizen. Do you think it's interesting that this is, that this, that the first, first, the 19th century quote was in the mm. Commons and this is in the Lords. The Lords Has classical yes. discourse <laughs> moved locations in the 20, in the 21st Yes. In the 21st century, <laughs> I mean, it's very. So, yeah. I think it's very. I think it's a really fascinating aspect of this. Who is using classical, yes. classical yeah. tags? Yeah. Who who has that resource to draw on what they're doing with it? Because we've certainly seen, as as you pointed out with your first slide, the mm -hmm. radicals saying, "Let's get away from the ancient stuff. Let's get, let's stick with, with the modern." <laughs> and there's always that question, you know. Why are, what's the motivation behind the use of the appeal to mm. classical authority? Is it always well intentioned? This is a great exemplar which totally clarifies the point I'm going to make so everybody can understand it better. Or is it a way of con controlling, yeah. shutting out, excluding? I think that's one of the big questions of the moment. And, and I think that understanding how that the kind of excavations that you're, yeah. you're making are really important in understanding how that, how that discourse has shifted and changed. Because, as I mean, Alison alluded to, our recent prime minister's well, this is it, appeal yeah. <laughs> to classical figures, we might often say, is, it, is this just a bit of showing off? Is this, is this an identity creation? Is this serving any valuable political purpose or uh, is this is this even what what we might call a dog whistle mm. to a particular subset of the audience who are activated by hearing a mention of a classical <laughs> figure in in some way so i think i think this is mm. a really, it's a really you know important and, point. and i think that one of the things that's really important about doing this now is that i mean sometimes in classical reception projects, people have just been satisfied to sort of compile a list of mentions and, you know, yeah. oh, look, you know, Thucydides got mentioned 30 times in the debates for this particular, for this particular topic, but only twice here. Um, that it's become a critical analysis, what's going, why is this being used? And I think that's something that's really important about how we're, how we're doing this now, something that's changed and I think I think is really 
really significant. So Yes, absolutely. And, and your point about the Lords is a, a very, really good one, because I don't think necessarily people are doing this in the way that, you know, we get the Cincinnatus reference as a kind of, like you say, wink perhaps to a particular part of the audience. Um, this does seem to be like a common language. Um, so if you mm. talk about um, Cicero and you talk about a, a, um, a, a, an example like Kiwis Romanus Sum, I am a, a Roman citizen, um, it's something that people, it activates something in, in that particular audience who have a shared understanding of what this means. Um, that seems to be my, re or, or at the moment, sort of some of the ways that it's, it's used in the Lords, whereas now in the Commons, it's mm. become much more of a tool to, to kind of think about or, or to, to either confuse or to obfuscate or to, to try and, and make something um, make a point that isn't necessarily, doesn't need to be made in that way. Um, so it's a very interesting <laughs> shift from, from one to the other, I think. And similarly, in, in the 19th century example, again, it was sort of a, well, I mean, you know, far less well known than the I am a Roman citizen example, the private ballot and the problems that, you know, that Cicero said this was one of the worst things that could happen for, for Roman politics. It was because that's how you made people mm. understand your point, right? Cicero said it, and, and this is something we need to think about. Um, so um, Henry Hunt was not happy, but, but I think probably some others might have been. Um, so so I've, again, Alison has introduced my work so thoroughly well, I don't think I need to go over it. But what I want to do is talk a little bit about one of the... about um, Firstly, about ancient democracy and its relevance to today. So over the past maybe few years, um, ancient democracy, Athenian democracy, has had a bit of a moment as an alternative to how democracy operates, to our current representative democracy. And as people have felt alienated and distanced from parliaments, maybe that their representatives aren't in fact representing them, there's been, there's been a lot of clamour and interest in that smaller scale participatory system where all citizens, and of course we always have to note, all citizens is a very small proportion of the population, it's only the men, it's only those of free status, women, over, overseas, people from other cities, um, not even people from other parts of the world, just people from down the road, don't even get to participate. And um, obviously the enslaved population just didn't get to participate. So ancient democracy isn't as fully inclusive as people might like a democracy to be now, but where the people it did include did if they wished to, and there's a lot of debate about how much people wish to and how much time people spent skirting their responsibilities and social obligations. There's a lot of very intriguing things in Athenian democracy, certainly in the Cultural History of Democracy in Antiquity volume, we tried to pull out with the help, Paul Cartledge and I tried to pull out with the help of a great set of contributors in how um, in how the processes enabled people to feel that they were they were taking part, they were more bought in. What were the cultural processes that bound people to participating in their political system? So the whole political and religious system working together. Again, that's a really interesting thing to explore as questions of the relationship between church and state are very much talking issues, both here and in, in the USA for different reasons. Um, I mean, there's a lot of interest in ancient participatory democracy and whether modern technology can make it possible. So this is the kind of Bitcoin bit. Um, <laughs> that whether because we can all speak to each other, we can all vote instantly, we can all participate, communicate, join in, there can be very large scale conversations. 
people have said, well, you know, we can do replicate Athenian democracy on a larger scale with technology. But I think a qu cursory glance at any large scale online conversation <laughs> will tell you that that is not going to get you very far. I mean, clearly, abuse and and um, abuse and bad quality discussion was probably a feature of Athenian democracy, but I think we've plumbed new depths in some of our current modern conversations. Um, also, the idea of kingship, I, th I thought that I'd mentioned that as it's sort of particularly relevant as we transition between, between reigns. And one of the most interesting things about Athenian democracy is that it didn't, there wasn't a king. Athens imagined that they'd had kings in the past, Maybe they had, maybe they hadn't. There's no firm evidence for the existence of the, of the monarchs who'd entered mythology and re revered. So it's almost as if we'd only ever had King Arthur. And, but as every public building was decor would be decorated with reliefs of King Arthur's great deeds, um, many of them actually are. Um, but... The Athenians used Theseus and Erechtheus and other monarchs as symbols of their cultural identity without there being a permanent holder of the realm. They did have an annual official who was selected by lot from the whole population who fulfilled the duties a king would do if they had a king, so officiated at big processions and sacrifices and things like that. So I'm just putting it out there that the Athenians filled what the political theorist Claude Lefort called the democratic void in a very interesting way that we might think about. And then just to, just to sort of introduce a couple of things I'm working on at the moment. One of them uh, is a new handbook of Greek political thought. One of the issues, you'd think that everything anybody could have thought about texts that were written 2,000, 2,400 years ago had already been thought. But the changing political circumstances, the changing political discourse, the different ways in which they're invo invoked at different times mm. makes them, we have to rethink anew. And one of the current issues with ancient political thought, my own subdiscipline, is that it's somewhat being captured by, I think, what from our perspective we'd call a fairly right-wing, very traditionalist point of, well, presents itself as traditionalist, actually is radical and possibly distractive in a way that cons modern conservatism often is. And they've sort of captured ancient political thought with a few very honorable exceptions in the United States. And I wanted there to be a handbook that students could use that represented a wider range of approaches. So my big project is pulling this together. And I, there's one of my contributors sitting, sitting here. So um, I'm very thrilled with the amazing group of people who are contributing to that from across political and methodological perspectives. I'm also continuing to work on Plato and again looking at what it means to reread dialogues using contemporary ways of thinking. So I'm using phenomenological theories and queer theories to unlock ideas about the way Plato messes with time and time messes with Plato and you can see both those things taking place in the, in the dialogues. Um, so I think we'll let's move back to some of our political examples because Shushma has come up with some great examples for us to to look at, and I think we've got we've got about ten minutes. I think to, okay, to right, do these do properly. This so, <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to sort of um, to bring us back to some of those those Roman ideas and, and where sort of all of this started um, in in terms of, of, of how kind of the, the, my interest in Nero has, has transformed in various years and, and um, as we, we go through the political system. Um, I just wanted to give you like a little bit of a snapshot and an example of some of the ways that um, mod, you know, political, 
Roman politics um, often enters into the popular discourse as well as that sort of Hansard side of things. So we've got the the, um, the parliamentary records, but even the idea of Nero fiddling while Rome burns is so pervasive. You know, it's a meme. It's everywhere. Um, there is, a, a, you know, a, an incredible academic has written a whole paper on where that the history of Nero fiddling as Rome burns as a um, an idea. Um, and it really does uh, go back very far, as has um, Gina Kloss um, as well, ex-fiddle while why uh, burned examples of history's hottest meme, and she ranks them all. It's, I know, I know, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? Um, but just from uh, sort of recent times, um, you know, including uh, um, uh, not just sort of UK and American examples, but um, in Brazil, when you had the, um, with instances of the pandemic, Brazil's president fid fiddles as a pandemic loons, um, Brazil's Bo Bolsonaro dismisses Amazon rainforest fires outcry. I used to be called Captain Chainsaw. Now I am Nero setting Amazon, uh, the Amazon aflame. So fiddling while Rome burns, setting Rome on fire, things that, that absolutely are being um, used as, as political uh, bywords for, for, and again, as in the Lord's examples, I think, mm. these are just ways of making, making people understand things. It's a, it's a, a, a sort of currency in a way. Um, and then from one of, uh, one of the ones that I found most interesting, uh, Bernie Sanders at the Democratic National Convention, uh, Nero fiddle while Rome burned, the president golfs. So again, that idea of neglecting your duty um, and not doing, doing what you should. Um, but like I say, uh, uh, Gina Kloss has put together a wonderful, um, in uh, the online uh, magazine Eidolon, a wonderful list of, of all of these things. Um, and it's, uh, you know, Nero is, is a great example, but we also get it with Julius Caesar, of course, as well. He was <laughs> not an emperor, as you all know, but um, certainly doesn't escape any of these. And um, this is a Sunday Times cartoon that you may recognize from this year, Partygate, uh, when it came out, Mary had to take to Twitter very quickly to <laughs> explain what was going on and, and talk about it. But um, uh, Julius Caesar, of course, being stabbed in the back with corkscrews rather than, um, than with daggers. And it's interesting. So the reason, the other reason why I wanted to talk about these is because it signals a, um, a moment, doesn't it? When you mm. see Julius Caesar being stabbed in the back, you know what's going to happen. You know the decline that's coming. You know that then we're going to get some sort of significant change. Of course, in, in ancient Rome, it signaled the end of, of the Republic, um, you know, symbolically, if not technically, um, and into, into, the, um, into a monarchy. There's something significant is going to happen when these kinds of things mm. start to enter the political discourse. I think, I think that's absolutely... Absolutely fascinating, and yeah, that the, the figure that the figure that's being mapped onto here is Julius Caesar, mm. precisely the person at that critical transition from at the fall of the Roman yeah. Republic, where uh, when you know I think that there's been we've had years of you know I'm Pericles or oh but is he Alcibiades <laughs> the glamorous naughty bad boy and you know in your dreams <laughs> former prime minister oh, yes, indeed. and he actually I think you know I mean I always said no he's Critias who is <laughs> the um very wrong thinking relative of Plato's who um who um installed was the leader of a oligarchy installed at the end of the Peloponnesian War under Spartan control. So when Athenian democracy fell under external control, yeah. um, I do, I have always felt that that was the great Athenian counterexample of, you know, mm, this is, absolutely. you know, who you should be comparing yourself to. But I yeah. think the I think that this image and the moment it evokes is just so incredibly yeah. apposite and deeply worrying. But I think, you know, it is, you know, just sort of revisit a point we're saying, you know, it is a very, that is a wide, I mean, maybe it's part of a very long, complex history of Precisely. classical reception yeah. because obviously we don't just know Julius Caesar's story from, read, from ancient history lessons. We don't just know, we know him from Shakespeare. And so it's got a long, complicated history because Shakespeare is writing plays about tyranny in a complex political 
environment at a moment of a moment of huge change and his Julius Caesar is particularly well placed in a moment of political complexity and engages in it in a quite mm. complicated way. So these when you're and this is one of the things that I learned on my anachronism and antiquity mm. project is that when you're these classical illusions they're not it's not just as one relate it's not just a one shot mapping from a single now to a single past it scopes in a whole array of different things along the way which make it very complicated and yeah. subtle but all the more fascinating Absolutely. for it i think yeah and it's also very interesting when people um, filmmakers and, and you know, um, in, in political culture and in, in wider popular culture play around with the story. So, anyone seen Quo Vadis, the film? Yeah, 1951, one of my favourite films. It's wonderful, um, absolutely brilliant. But at the end of it, you get the advent of Christianity, right? And, and the idea of the fall of the Roman Empire, and that that is the moment that, that everything switches and everything is better and everything is glorious. And of course, that's not historical. The, the Roman Empire <laughs> carried on for a long time after, after Nero. There was a civil war, but then there was a new dynasty of emperors, the Flavians, and we went back to that. Um, and similarly with Gladiator, <laughs> you still get I don't know if you do here, but I, I have had students come in thinking the, the Republic was restored again after the death of Commodus. So it is, it's, it's interesting how even these, these political moments, you know, resonate, but they also, you know, we create them. We create these political moments in, in popular culture as well, and, and those then become part of a wider discourse. So it's, um, it's, the, it's again, it's the unpacking and, 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 and delayering of all of these things. So. Back yeah. to the Greeks. Um, yeah, back to the back to the Greeks. Um, I um, I first used this cartoon in a talk I gave. I think four four years. Gosh, four years. Getting on for four years ago now, and but I think it's aged rather aged rather well. It seemed to speak to the the present moment. But I was very interested, as I said, we were talking earlier about about democracy and the way that democracy can be personified and that that in itself is a very classical tradition so mm. there is democracy crowning a citizen on an athenian law against tyranny that was set up at a point when the athenians were worried that some of their elite might have got ideas they shouldn't be having about grabbing power in the fourth century and here in America, the figure of the Statue of Liberty obviously realizes that idea of American democracy as a, as a person who can be hurt, who can have opinions, who can mm. intervene in the, in the discourse. And here is democracy and Trump having a little little discussion in a way that seems rather seems actually rather prescient prescient now and in a story that's still unfolding but i that that idea idea that democracy is something that can be personified the personification of values like freedom like democracy is something that goes all the way back to classical culture and that you know can be can be engaged now and I, it's very you know that we've got these ancient cartoons illustrating laws that they fit so nicely with cartoons from newspapers now i think is a really interesting way that that the classical past and the present interact with each other so so very so very strongly and memorably and I think speak to the point that Shashma has been making all along that these classical moments can be can crystallize an idea a thought an argument and make it very accessible and easily grasped for and easily grasped for an audience immediately mm. so um nicely <laughs> yeah so we wanted to finish off just by giving you an update on what's happening in the class classics in 
um, Newnham and Cambridge now and a little bit about what we're actually going to be doing. Um, here are last year's finalists visiting the Fitzwilliam Museum's Scythe and Gold exhibition at this time last year, which was uh, a wonderful moment, both that we, we for us in the return from the pandemic to go and have an outing together and look at ancient stuff was very exciting <laughs> and fulfilling. But I want, wanted to emphasize how vibrant our current classics community here in the college is. We've, had, we've got a great bunch of new freshers joining our existing students. They're in, all enthused and engaged by a wide range of things. I think two of them are acting in the Greek play and a couple of others are involved in other capacities in that production. So it's something that we're, there, there's a lot going on. We've got postgraduates engaged in a wide array of studies from very traditional linguistic work to studying the reception of the classical past in European right-wing thought of the recent of recent times and um, there's also the course itself is making a commitment to encourage students to understand the way classics operates in the present world while they're studying while they're studying their language work while they're reading Homer and Virgil as they absolutely should do they're also thinking about what that means now. And Shushma is going to be playing a big part in that teaching in the faculty over the coming year. So if you'd like to just say a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, contribute to both Classics Now and Classics Live. So Classics Now is for first year students um, and uh, all the first two years of students, so either prelim or 1A first two years of students and um, and they um, are going to get a series of lectures from le le lectures across the faculty and, and, and outside as well on how classics resonates in our modern um, discourse how classics is what we are real touch points in classics what is going on in the most up-to-date research that's being produced um, and I'm uh, really excited to be able to contribute something on um, imperialism and empire so that's coming up and it's going to run th across the year um, and as I say there's a wonderful wonderful lineup of speakers um, and then classics live is a third year course that I'm co-teaching with Ingo Gildenhart which is um, incredibly exciting and I'm, we're both really excited about um, which will be t teaching in Lent term so we have um, a wonderful again li array lineup of guest speakers to come in and talk to us about various points of, of classics now everything from video games to um, Michel Foucault, which is kind of now, um, to, to, um, uh, to, to novels, to, to all sorts of ideas of, of how classics functions in our, our modern community. So not just the political, but the literary, the tra tragic, you know, all of the things that we were talking about uh, or could have talked about yeah. um, <laughs> today, um, we will be looking at um, during the course. So we've got a lineup of wonderful speakers um, who will give a guest lecture and then we'll spend two hours deconstructing their guest lecture. So we're really excited about that. Um, and that's, you know, just a, a very small part of what the faculty, I think, are doing to make classics um, and, and to keep classics exciting and, um, and lively and just the wonderful discipline it is with the balance of the really rigorous sort of language teaching that is, of course, still the, the fundamental part of the course, but with, um, uh, you know, the vibrancy of, of classics today. Yeah, and as a, as a final point, um, Newnham has play, is playing a part in in the development of the subject, um, Mary Beard's offering of Joyce Reynolds Awards for undergraduates will hopefully play a part in encouraging applications for the subject and students from a wider, more diverse range of backgrounds who will bring important perspectives to the studying, to the discussions in which they take in which they take part. So 
again away. So I've just sort of come around full circle. Newnham is only across the road from the Faculty of Classics. It's a very close relationship. We play a big part in the life of the faculty, I think since the opening of the Iris, goddess, uh, cafe, and even more significant part in the informal conversations that classics is involved with. You can usually find your colleagues in sipping a coffee on our premises, so that's quite, quite helpful. But I think it is a great, very positive moment for the subject, both here in the college and in the in the faculty, in the university more broadly. It is a time of controversy, of engage, of, of debates that sometimes take a negative tone, but I think what I've, I think we've hopefully set out to you today are some of the exciting and interesting ways in which one can engage with classics critically, drawing on the best of the past and contributing to a great future for the subject. So now I think we're happy to take, take questions. And we've got a roving mic, so yeah. Thank you very much, um, Emma Maudsley, uh, Geography Fellow. Um, what do you, either of you work on sort of the classics beyond the core of Europe? I'm thinking of the Eastern Roman Empire, of course, but also beyond. Um, to what extent do um, someone like Nehru, um, who was incredibly educated across a huge range of um, cultures and traditions, and do, do, do you, does anybody look at how he might have um, invoked the classics? Well, to, to, I think, yes, we both do. So I think we've both got answers, answers there. Um, and you're right that thinking about the ancient world more broadly is hugely, is a hugely important part of how classics is developing. So one of the things I've done in my work on democracy, for example, is to look at how the development of Athenian democracy isn't something that sprung up new within the Greek world, but draws on, long, draws on and transforms long-standing traditions of wisdom and knowledge and leadership gained from look, both developed within and gained from looking at other civilizations of the ancient Near East. That's something that I think is, is an important counter to narratives, to very, to narratives of European civilization that are often invoked that actually the story doesn't start in Greece, it starts in a much wider world. So that's, that's one answer there. And certainly in text we do see, we do so my, my authors, so Xenophon for example, is, I mean, spends, travels within, travels in Persia, engages with that culture, and we get to see a lot of how Greeks think about other cultures through reading reading his work. Um, absolutely, the course is being our introduction to ancient history for students, and this is another course that Shashma is involved with, is absolutely being reoriented to start with that broader perspective. So yeah, maybe you absolutely. could say a bit about that and then about Nero. <laughs> I'll leave Nero to you. <laughs> Um, no, absolutely. So the Empires course um, goes, you know, spans. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice um, course, actually, because it sort of begins with Persia and Greece and ends with Parthia and Rome. So we, we sort of go through um, all of these different interactions that happen. But I think you're absolutely right. It's, it, it's incredibly important to remember antiquity as ancient cultures, not an ancient culture. And I think one of the things that first got, you know, that I always found so exciting about Rome is its size, that it really does go, you know, from where we are right now through to, um, you know, what we call the Middle East and, and, and interactions with China, interactions with India. You get temples of Augustus in, in you know, to Augustus in, in India and coins, coins circulating all, all throughout different places. And that's a really important part of the, the message, if you like, to, to include um, in our teaching. But um, also from a re research perspective, I think one of the things actually 
that's got me thinking about this the most um, recently is um, the National Trust Project, because one of the things that I, I find or have, have sort of started to notice is people like Agatha Christie and other, other collectors they don't compartmentalise in terms of what is ancient. So the, the digs were in Mesopotamia, but the the kinds of collections that they have range, you know, China, India, all across. Her her actual ancient, uh, the ancient Chinese collection she has is fa absolutely fascinating um, in terms of its collection, um, in terms of what she's doing with how she's curating that that collection, um, much more so than the Greek and Roman, actually, <laughs> I think. Um, so it's. I think one of the things that classical reception does and can do is perhaps make us rethink some of the silos that we put antiquity into, um, and because those haven't always been there. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons why they are there now, and that have to do with complicated histories of empire and, and so forth. But um, sometimes there are triggers in the past where you can kind of think, ah, oh, okay, so actually ancient meant ancient all over the world, not just um, ancient Greece and Rome. And, and that, you know, that's also true, as Carol was saying, of how we study the, the ancient Greek and Roman past as well, because they weren't just thinking about mm. what are we going to do, what is our particular kind of narrow field um, of vision, but were interacting far, far, far more widely. And, and again, that's a really interesting way. Nero in Greece is, you know, the thing that he's always hammered over the head for, that he was far more interested in Greece than in Rome and, and that sort of thing. But um, actually, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really good way to think about things, I think. Hi, um, Anne Wilson. I'm a classics graduate in, of, of Newnham. Um, so currently, uh, we're sort of examining our relationship with our own history and colonialism and so on, and in particular, um, our history of, of slavery and our connections mm -hmm. with that. And I was wondering how that inflected our view of, of Greece and Rome as slave-owning societies. I think I think that 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 this. This is a moment where uh, the way we in, the way we think about and investigate and understand the re the role of sl of enslavement in ancient societies is very is very important and it's one of the things that needs to be rethought. So one of the things that I'm working on, particularly in my own work, is looking at is looking at how slavery is a metaphor for political unfreedom mm. in ancient thought and how that's how people have almost glossed over the centrality of that metaphor and how it's not a metaphor how it both is and isn't a metaphor in the context of ancient society how when when um, Socrates tells people that they will learn to be a properly free person in his tuition, as Xenophon Socrates does tell people, that that's a very political, a very political point, and one with, I think, you know, very complicated consequences, because there the classical reception angle is when, for example, the founding fathers of of um, the United States, many of them saw Xenophon Socrates as an incredibly important point of reference. They thought those works were really central to their understanding of the ancient past and to their own ethical formation. And if they, and that, that somehow they, that elision in the ancient thought got built into their own thinking in ways that hasn't really been properly tackled and criticized. And now is a moment, I think, to do that. And people are doing that. So it is, I think, a very important central issue. So that, that's where it fits just into my work. I mean, you, your questions, you know, sort of sketched out a whole wide array of ways in which areas in which that might be that is an important topic to be considering 
Absolutely. And, and again, it's something that is going to be central to sort of the Classics Now program and, and, and the teaching on the teaching side of, of what we do. Um, also an MPhil course I'm running on classical reception um, in the name of classics, it's called. So things that have been done in the name of classics and, and, and can be done and, and, and uh, again, there's going to be lectures that, that really deconstruct some of these ideas as well. But, um, or sorry, classes, not lectures. I'm not talking at them. Um, mm -hmm. But the the I think there's really important points here that um, you know again intersect a little bit with 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 our work. So for me, it's more the sort of political culture elements of of how when these things were being debated in you know, the, the Abolition of Slavery Act and all of those kinds of things, what that relationship is. Because all, again, as, as Carol was saying, um, the chains of receptions that come down from antiquity to now, this is a process. It's, it's not um, you know, two fixed points that, that can ever meet. There's a huge amount in, in the middle. And I'm really interested in the, in the middle bit <laughs> as well um, of, of how we reach where we are. Um, and also... Particularly, there's some very interesting discourse around race and the idea of, of in antiquity, slavery wasn't based on race and how that then relates to modern discussions of slavery and whether that's right and whether that word is even the word that we should use to think, conceptualise these things. And these are really, really important points and they have to be, uh, you know, they are, I think, central to the new um, teaching programme that, that we pursue. But they're also really important discussions to have because I think one of the great things about our students is they are so good at, at talking about these things and their you know their vocabulary is so wide and so inclusive and 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 you know it's it makes for really interesting ways of understanding how these um we can understand them and and you know research-led teaching but also teaching that informs research mm -hmm. and that reciprocal um sort of relationship that you have is that's one of the the most um you know ways that it can be be the most productive i think I'm Anne Matthews, Classics Graduate at Newman. Following up on slavery point, you mentioned Quo Vadis. Yes. I'd like to know if you have any comments on another great Roman film, Spartacus. Yes. Well, <laughs> many. <laughs> I won't give you another lecture. God, I, yeah, no, well, of course, the great Marxist um, kind of idea of, of how uh, to... to make a, a society in, in Rome that, that can be equal or, or attempt to try and uh, idea of, of the rise of the proletariat. Um, I think those kinds of films, things like, um, you know, because they're, they're of, as, as, as you'll know, of, of similar eras, they have many of the same actors in them, um, there's lots of crossover between those, those things. Um, they're, they're really, again, important ways of, of showing how politics seeps through um, in these kinds of models. And they inform each other. So to say that Spartacus is, is written, you know, is a Marxist reading of, of a very, very small bit of Plutarch, <laughs> essentially, on, on Crassus and, and, and so forth, um, that then gives it a kind of um, political relevance in, in now, but also gives us a way of reframing um, antiquity. So one of the things that I think is most important about classical reception studies and the theory that has come out of that field um, in recent years is that this is a, a, a reciprocal kind of um, arrangement. If we do do a Marxist reading of, of um, Plutarch or, or that story, it's not, that doesn't just give us something um, to tell us about the 1950s, 1960s, what the, the climate was in those periods. It also gives us another way to understand the processes that happen in antiquity. So how these people are, um, how, how we, we give a theoretical framework to the worker in antiquity when we have so little evidence for ways of you know what, what people's real experiences are. There are great bits in you know novels like um, the Metamorphoses of Apuleius and, and, and so forth. And, and that those kinds of things do give us little bits and pieces of, of what we can do with, with that kind of voice. But actually, I think classical reception studies really does give us a way to, into um, thinking of new ways to give people from antiquity, like the enslaved, like the proletariat, um, that we have very little evidence for more of a voice. 
Thank you. Uh, if, it's, uh, if there's truth in the proposition that Athenian democracy only lasted for 160 years, has the world been on a mistaken journey <laughs> never to arrive uh, to try and copy Athenian democracy? Or is it possible that uh, in the near future with the digital world, we can have a, digital, uh, a city democracy, but in a nation state? That one's for you, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, um, that, I mean, that is the, the how long Athenian democracy lasted um, is, is a topic that is of it, some, some debate. Um, did it last that core classical period? What do we think of the democracy, the city democracies of the Hellenistic world where where ancient cities sort of maintained their independent local government, but with um, a king or emperor or official of a king or emperor exercising oversight, receiving some of the tax monies, dealing with the foreign policy. Do we count that as democracy or not? That's a topic which has, which is currently much disputed and so um, Paul Cartledge would definitely say no that <laughs> it was only Athen only Athenian you know, only Athenian democracy really counts as democracy otherwise it's just sparkling popular rule or something <laughs> like that um, or not even popular rule um, but there are a lot of people who I mean and again this is somewhere where following the example of Joyce Reynolds and looking at the epigraphy and seeing what's going on in those cities across the across the Greek world as it uh, in the Macedonian former Macedonian Empire then the Roman Empire how how those cities continued an element of self-governance while interacting with larger groups, organizing themselves into federations, fitting into empires, whether that might be a better model, as you said, for cities that have to be part of larger entities than Athens itself, which was not very good at fitting into larger groups and, um, you know, didn't play nicely if it wasn't in charge. So, I think I think that there, that is an interest. You know, is there a trade-off between absolute self autoc autocratic self-governance of a city and its ability to coordinate with a larger political body? Is a very interesting one. I mean, my, I'm a very much a pessimist on the digital democracy side of things. I think that it's very it's very difficult. I mean, you know, I say this as somebody who worked in technology for a, a long time and have, you know, seen how, seen how um, online discourse and different um, online communities have developed over, over time. And I'm some, I mean, what I think we're very clear about is that, is that, um, Athenian, Athenian, you know, Athenian things such as, as votes of the entire population or the whoever's in the assembly that day, it can't really replicate that well at a national level. And whether having online based online based um, voting systems would work any better, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical about that. Um, you know, I wish I wish it were different, but I don't think I don't think it is. But I do think there's a lot we can learn from Hellenistic democracy, and that's something that we could understand a lot better. There's one one, one question here. Question. Yeah. Sorry. Hello, Penny Hubbard, the former <laughs> development director. So thrilled that you're here, Shasma, and thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more? I think the I think the Classics Faculty was really ahead of its time at Cambridge in terms of recognising that offering that fourth year 
or the early year could make a real difference to the reach of students that could come to study. And I, I never, even after all my time here, understood really what you were doing in that year. And I think the audience <laughs> might be quite okay. interested just to hear yeah, a small absolutely. synopsis. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so undergrad study in classics at Cambridge now has now has two entry points. And the traditional entry point was that you arrived with A-levels in Latin and possibly Greek as well, and you studied for three years. And it was assumed that you arrived equipped to read Latin texts from the moment you got here, and you'd be got up to the same level at Greek soon soon thereafter, which is a pretty intensive and I mean, it's called intensive Greek and they really mean it when they say intensive. The four year course it was launched to enable students who didn't have A level Latin to join that course. So the initial year started out really as pretty much purely language training to get students from who'd not had the chance to study Latin before or not had the st chance to study it to A-level standard to get to spend a year in Cambridge intensively learning Latin so that then they were ready to meet the incoming three-year cohort and do intensive Greek with them, <laughs> which was a, I mean, a huge, huge ask. And my admiration for the students who've taken that on Often without, because knowing that you're going to like studying ancient languages is quite a tough bet. Some people love it, some people really do not love it, and some people thrive on it, and some people really do not thrive. And, you know, I think that's absolutely fair enough. Not everybody likes the same things, and not everybody has to be good at the same things. But the Cambridge Classics course does ask people to be good at some very quite very specific things. The prelims course, the four year course has evolved a little bit. And from this year onwards, it is really quite significantly changed to be more integrated with the first year of the four year course. So our students who've spent that initial year don't have that, you know, that they've been in a room on their own learning Latin and then they're let loose with the other students. It's now much more integrated. I mean, certainly in college, we, we've always given the four-year students a much broader initial year, introducing them to the other aspects of the subject and making sure they're really well prepared to, to deal with Greek as well the following autumn. But that has been a horrible cliff for students on that pathway that we're hopeful that the new structure of the fir those first two years of the course, which is starting this term, will address and sort of we've spread. So the students coming in for the four year course now start Latin, start Latin the summer before they arrive. And some of them, so of the, we've got three students arriving for the four year course of what they've already been here. They're amazing. I'm so excited this the incoming year we've got this year. There's such a great bunch of bunch of students and I, to actually meet them when they're here in person, because of course we interview them remotely now. So it's often the first time we've, when they get here is the first time we've actually met them in person. So of, of those three students, one has GCSE Latin and two are ab initio starting not entirely from scratch because usually students have had Attend, had a taster course or a off timetable um, Latin study group that hasn't led to a qualification or they've been to a summer school or an outreach event that has, you know, we, we and they can be confident that this is the thing for them, which is really important because the work, it is, it is a tough course and there's no getting around. I mean, like many tough courses are and, you know, you could say, well, you know, natural sciences isn't a walk in the park either, um, you know, and let's not even get started on maths. But you know, classics is a very tough, is a very tough and demanding course. And so we, we pour a huge amount of resource. So um, one of our language teaching team, Hilary Goy, is <laughs> here and she's a huge help with 
our language teaching and you know we've got a a lot of a lot of people a lot of resource helping our students with the language work but the the aim is that there shouldn't be such a by the time they finished the one year or the two years of prelims and 1a that they're a very integrated cohort all equipped to make the same choices in the rest of the course that's really really important but it has been a really important way of making the course more accessible to that large number of students who don't have the opportunity to take Latin A level in the previously I mean teaching of Latin in schools is expanding and improving and there's great work being done on that front but it's still very important that we are able to admit students who haven't had the chance to study classical languages in any shape before um, so yeah thank you <laughs> So thanks to your amazing questions, we have overrun slightly, um, but I hope you get a sense, I hope you're as excited as I am about what amazing successes um, we have to our classical tradition and just the way classics is evolving. Um, it's, it's tremendously exciting. Um, I already I know I enjoy my conversations over lunch. Um, so thank you hugely for giving up your Sunday morning. Um, and we've got a few little things to say. Thank you very much. And if you could join me in a round of applause as well, please. Oh, push. <laughs> <laughs>